Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video, we're going to look at several tools we can use for analyzing the eigenvalue spectra of different matrices. We'll first look at the gush gorin circle theorem that allows us to bound the positions of eigenvalues of a matrix. And then we'll look at several questions in the sensitivity of eigenvalues to small perturbations in a matrix. In the previous video, we saw that there was a link between eigenvalues and polynomial roots. And therefore, in general, one has to use iterative methods to compute eigenvalues. However, it's possible to get some information about the locations of eigenvalues using gush gorins theorem. So let's define D of C and R to be a disk in the complex plane that is centered at C with radius R. And now let's suppose that A is a complex n by n matrix. So for i equal 1 to n, we can define a corresponding gersh gorin disk that is centered at AII, the ith diagonal entry of A, with radius Ri. And here, Ri is defined as the sum from j equal 1 to n, excluding i, of the modulus of Aij. So specifically, this is the sum of moduli in the ith row of all of the off-diagonal terms in the matrix. gush gorin's theorem tells us that all of the eigenvalues of A are contained within the union of the n gush gorin disks of A. And we'll now look at why this is true. Let's now take a look at proving gush gorin's circle theorem. And here we're going to consider a complex n by n matrix A that has elements A, I, J. And we can define disks in the complex plane, D of C and R, that are centered on C and have radius R. And gersh gorin's theorem tells us that all the eigenvalues of A have to be contained within the n gersh gorin disks, D, A, I, I, R, I, where A, I, I is a diagonal entry in our matrix, and R, I is a radius, that is computed by summing the magnitudes of all of the off-diagonal entries in the corresponding row of the matrix. So let's go ahead now and prove this result. So let lambda be an eigenvalue of A with corresponding eigenvector v. And since the scale of eigenvectors is arbitrary, we can choose to scale v so that one component vi is equal to 1, and all of the components satisfy that the magnitude of vj is less than or equal to 1. So we can ensure then that this vi term will be the largest in magnitude. So now let's look at the matrix multiplication of A V equal lambda V for the ith row. So in this case, then we'll have the sum from J equal 1 to N of A I J V J is equal to lambda V I. And since we chose vi to be equal to 1, we can write this just as lambda. So what we can now do is we can separate out the diagonal term in this sum. So if we do that, then we'll get the following expression. The sum from j equal 1 to n for j not equal to i of a 
i j v j plus a i i v i is equal to lambda. But we know here that v i is equal to one, and so therefore this term here will cancel away. And if we move the AII over to the other side, then we're left with lambda minus AII is equal to the sum from j equal 1 to n of AIJ VJ for j not equal to i. And what we can now do is look at taking the magnitudes of both sides. So if we look at the magnitude of this term, that will be equal to the magnitude of this term. And we can now use the properties of magnitudes and sums to say that this will be less than or equal to the sum from j equal 1 to n of j not equal to i of the magnitude of aij times the magnitude of vj. And we know that all of these vj are less than or equal to 1 in magnitude, so we can therefore say that this will be less than or equal to the sum from j equal 1 to n for j not equal to i of a i j in magnitude. And that precisely corresponds to our calculation of r i. So therefore we see then that this eigenvalue that was chosen arbitrarily has to lie within the corresponding Gersh-Gorin disk centered on AII with radius RI. And that will hold for all eigenvalues of this matrix. We say that a matrix is diagonally dominant if every row, the modulus of the diagonal term is greater than the sum of moduli for all of the off-diagonal terms. And it follows from gersh gorin's theorem that if we have a diagonally dominant matrix, then it cannot have a zero eigenvalue because none of the gersh gorin disks will intersect with a zero. And therefore we know that the matrix must be invertible. And there are a lot of cases where we encounter diagonally dominant matrices. For example, suppose we looked at the finite difference discretization matrix for the differential operator minus Laplacian plus the identity. Then in this case, the matrix will be diagonally dominant. So in two dimensions, this operator applied to a function u would give us minus uxx minus ury plus u. And if we looked at each row of the corresponding discretization matrix, then we would see that it would contain a diagonal entry equal to 4 divided by h squared plus 1, and it would also have 4 off-diagonal entries equal to minus 1 divided by h squared. And so we see here that the sum of the moduli of off-diagonal entries will be equal to 4 over h squared, and that is going to be smaller than 4 over h squared plus 1. So we have that diagonal dominance property in this case and therefore we have an invertible matrix. We'll now consider the sensitivity of eigenvalues to perturbations in the matrix A. And let's suppose now that A is a non-defective matrix, and therefore we know that A can be written as V D V inverse for a non-singular matrix V. So let's suppose now that delta A is a perturbation of A, and let's write that E is equal to V inverse delta A V. Now, if we look at V inverse applied to A plus delta A V, then we can write that out using linearity as V inverse A V plus V inverse delta A V, and that will be equal to D plus E. So before we proceed, we're going to introduce the concept of a similarity transformation. So suppose now that we have a non-singular matrix X, and we look at the map that takes a matrix A, to x inverse ax, then we call that a similarity transformation of A. And there's a useful theorem that tells us that a similarity transformation will preserve eigenvalues. And to see this, let's look at the corresponding characteristic polynomials. 
So if we start with the characteristic polynomial of x inverse ax, then we can write that as the determinant of z times i minus x inverse ax. And we can factor out an x inverse an x from both terms in this expression. So we have the determinant of x inverse applied to z times i minus a times x. And here we've used the fact that x inverse times x is equal to the identity. And we can then use the property that if we have the determinant of a product, it's equal to the product of determinants. So we can write this as the determinant of x inverse times the determinant of z times i minus a times the determinant of x. And since the determinant of x inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of x, those two terms cancel away, and we're left with just the determinant of z times i minus a. And that's equal to the characteristic polynomial of a. So therefore we see that the eigenvalues will be preserved. So if we look now at the identity v inverse a plus delta a v is equal to d plus e, then we see that that's actually a similarity transformation via the matrix v. So therefore we know that a plus delta a and d plus e have the same eigenvalues. So let's now say that lambda k for k equal 1 to n are the eigenvalues of a, and let's now say that lambda tilde is one of the eigenvalues of a plus delta a. So therefore we know that there'll be a corresponding complex vector w, such that lambda tilde and w are an eigenpair of d plus e. So we know then that d plus e times w will be equal to lambda tilde times w. This can be rewritten as w is equal to lambda tilde i minus d inverse applied to e multiplied by w. And this is a promising start because our aim here is to bound the difference between lambda tilde and one of the lambda k for some k. And if we look at this matrix lambda tilde i minus d inverse, then we see that this is diagonal and the entries on the diagonal are equal to 1 divided by lambda tilde minus lambda k. If we take norms of this expression, then we see that the vector norm of w is going to be less than or equal to the matrix norm of lambda tilde i minus d inverse times the matrix norm of e times the vector norm of w. And we can divide out the terms involving w, and we can also divide through by the first matrix norm, and we end up with the inequality that 1 divided by the matrix norm of lambda tilde i minus d inverse is less than or equal to the matrix norm of E. And for the term on the left hand side, we can simplify this since it's diagonal. And we know that the matrix norm of a diagonal matrix has a simpler form. So suppose we look at a diagonal matrix D. Then the matrix norm is defined as the maximum for all non-zero vectors v of the norm of dv divided by the norm of v. And we could write that out in component form as the maximum over all non-zero vectors v. And in the numerator, we'll have the vector with components d11, v1, d22, v2, up to dnn, vn. And we could replace each of those dii with the largest term, and that would give us a upper bound. So we know then that the norm has to be less than or equal to the maximum of the modulus of all of the dii, multiplied by the maximum over all non-zero vectors v of the norm of v divided by the norm of v. And that final term will cancel away, and this will show then that this will be equal then just the maximum dii term in modulus. And this gives us a bound 
And we know that we can achieve this bound if our vector v is aligned in the direction of the largest diagonal entry. So we therefore know that the norm of lambda tilde i minus d inverse will be equal to 1 divided by lambda tilde minus lambda k star, where lambda k star is the eigenvalue of a that is closest to lambda tilde. Therefore, it follows from our inequality that we have the, the modulus of lambda tilde minus lambda k star is going to be less than or equal to the norm of E. And going back to our definition, we know that that's equal to the norm of V inverse delta A V. And we can bound that by the norm of V inverse times the norm of delta A times the norm of V. And we can combine two terms in that expression to give us that that's equal to the condition number of V multiplied by the norm of delta A. And this result is known as the bauer fike theorem. So it tells us then that our perturbed eigenvalue has to be bounded within some distance away from one of the existing eigenvalues. And that bound is set by the condition number of V and the size of the matrix perturbation. So suppose then that we compute the eigenvalues lambda tilde i of the perturbed matrix A plus delta A, then the bauer fike theorem tells us that each of those lambda i tilde has to reside in a disk of radius condition number of V times the norm of delta A centered on some eigenvalue of A. So we see a few interesting things. We see that if V is polyconditioned, then even for small perturbations delta A, then the disks can be large. So we could have sensitivity to perturbations in this case. If we had a normal matrix A, for example, then we would know in that case that the condition number of V would be equal to 1. And in this case, then, the bar phi disk radius would just be equal to the norm of delta A. So the bauer fike theorem is a very useful tool, although it's worth noting that it does not tell us which disk lambda i tilde will reside in. So we could have the possibility here where all of the lambda i tilde could cluster into just one bauer fike disk. So let's consider this example here where we have three eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3 for our original matrix A and we could draw the bauer fike disk in this case, but we could have a situation here, hypothetically, where all of the perturbed eigenvalues live in the bauer fike disk for lambda 1. In the case when A and A plus delta A are Hermitian, we have a stronger result. So in this case, we know that our eigenvalues have to be real, and therefore we can order them. So let's suppose that for our matrix A, we have eigenvalues that we order lambda 1 less than or equal to lambda 2 up to lambda n. And for our perturbed matrix A plus delta A, we have eigenvalues lambda tilde 1 less than or equal to lambda tilde 2 up to lambda tilde n. Then in this case, Weyl's theorem tells us that the maximum difference between lambda i and the corresponding lambda tilde i is less than or equal to the norm of delta A. So here we have a specific matching for the ith eigenvalue. So in this case, for Hermitian matrices, if we think about it in terms of the bauer fike theorem, it tells us that each perturbed eigenvalue has to be within the corresponding bauer fike disk. Although, of course, in this case, all of those eigenvalues actually lie on the real line. The bauer fike theorem relates to perturbations of the whole eigenvalue spectrum, but we can also look at perturbations to individual eigenvalues. And let's now look at a small calculation where we can do this. The bauer fike theorem gives us a way to rigorously bound where eigenvalues will be if we perturb a matrix. But here we're going to look at an asymptotic approach to eigenvalue perturbations,
which can give us a useful alternative viewpoint. So let A here be a complex n by n Hermitian matrix and let lambda and v be an eigenpair of A. So lambda is an eigenvalue and v is an eigenvector. And we'll look at the perturbed problem. A plus E multiplied by V plus delta V is equal to lambda plus delta lambda times V plus delta V. And here, E is a Hermitian matrix perturbation. Delta V is an eigenvector perturbation. And delta lambda is an eigenvalue perturbation. So let's now look at what we can do from this expression. So let's first then expand and we'll use that a times v is equal to lambda v and because we're looking here at small perturbations we will drop second order terms. And that will then give us A times delta V plus EV is approximately equal to delta lambda V plus lambda delta V. And we could now pre-multiply by V star the conjugate transpose of V. And that would then give us V star A delta V plus V star EV is approximately equal to delta lambda V star V plus lambda V star delta V. So we have four terms here. However, we can actually simplify this expression. So suppose we consider the first term. We have V star A delta V. And we can now make use of an identity. So we know that the conjugate transpose of AB can be written as B star A star and therefore we know that AB can be written as the conjugate transpose of B star A star. So we'll make use of this identity. So we'll get the terms here in reverse order and conjugated. But since A is Hermitian then A star is equal to A and so we'll just get a copy of A here and then we'll get a V here and this will be all conjugated. So now we have an AV and we know that that will be equal to lambda V. So we can write then this is delta V star lambda V all conjugated and we can now apply the conjugate and again use our, our identities and we'll see then that this is equal to lambda V star delta V. And so we see here now that this term is actually the same as this term. So we can cancel these away. Therefore we can write down that V star EV is approximately equal to delta lambda V star V. And we can rearrange that then to see that delta lambda is approximately equal to V star EV over V star V. And we can use this now to say something about the magnitude of delta lambda. So if we look at the magnitude of delta lambda, that is going to be approximately equal to V star EV over the Euclidean norm of V squared. And we can now use uh, matrix norms and vector norms and we can say that this will be less than or equal to the 
Euclidean norm of V times the Euclidean norm of EV over the Euclidean norm squared of V. And we know here that since the matrix norm of E is computed by the maximum of the norm of EV over V, we can actually replace this then and say that this is less than or equal to the norm of E. And we have an, another factor of V that will cancel away here. So therefore, we end up with a useful result that the delta lambda in magnitude is approximately less than or equal to the matrix norm of E, the perturbation that we applied. So this is a useful result, and there are a few notes that we can make here. So the first note is that the perturbation bound does not depend on the condition number of V as we had in the Bauer-Feich theorem. So all we have here is a bound that depends on the norm of E. And the second note is that this is an asymptotic calculation. And therefore, it is rigorous only in the limit as perturbations tend to zero. So we don't have the same rigor that we have with the Bauer-Feich theorem, but this is still a very useful asymptotic result to be aware of.